Regan McNeil is a cheerful girl. She is 12 years old, heading into her teenage years and all the changes that they entail. Given this, it is only logical for her mother Chris to be expecting her behavior to change. But while Chris may be faced with the bittersweet feeling any parent has when seeing their child grow up, she knows better than to think that this is the only thing that will affect her daughter's behavior. Chris is a movie star, constantly moving from place to place and attracting attention to her life, as well as her daughter's. She is separated from Reagan's father and has a turbulent relationship with him. Along with the changes brought about by puberty, Chris understands and expects her daughter to be affected by the lives they lead. And as any decent parent in that situation, she is prepared to embrace her daughter and the ways in which she changes, come what may, because her daughter will not change past the point of familiarity. Only that is exactly what happens. In 1879, after burying one of his children amidst the harsh winter, a Cree man named Swift Runner murdered his wife and five remaining children. Their bodies were found butchered and scattered across the camp, with clear indication that Swift Runner had committed the grave crime of cannibalism. Swift Runner would be executed, and his case would become one of the most infamous instances of what was then called Wendigo Psychosis by the psychiatrists of the time. To the Ojibwe, Cree, and other indigenous peoples of the region, it was no illness that had led Swift Runner to murder and consume his loved ones. They believed that the terrible deeds of the man had been done under a malicious influence. The idea of possession is intrinsically tied to mental health because it is intrinsically tied to behavior. If in the past people thought themselves or others possessed, it is because they experienced things that led them to believe that that was the only logical explanation. The Wendigo is a folklore monster of many peoples living in the American North. It is a demon associated with greed and hunger, and it is said to corrupt individuals with a maddened desire for human flesh. Amidst the harsh cold of winter, it is not hard to imagine that people whose mental state was fraught by the worsening conditions were less hesitant to resort to cannibalism and maybe even kill others in order to survive. Because the actions of those who committed these crimes were so unlike what they had habitually displayed to their loved ones, so unfamiliar to them, it was not a stretch to consider that there was an external interference by a demon, evil spirit, or other such malevolent entity. This is the question that the exorcist asks of us. What if they were right? What if demons exist and act in the way that we have always feared? Charms of all sorts have always been carried by people of all faiths. While many amulets of religions across the world are often believed to possess warding qualities, pushing away evil with the idea of supreme good, others seem to draw their power from the supernatural entities they are supposed to represent. An example of this are the statues of the Egyptian god Bess, a benevolent trickster, protector of children and pregnant women who scares away demons with his ugliness. It stands to reason that people would carry the symbols of good-natured entities in order to receive their protection. However, there are other kinds of charms that ward off dark entities, not because they represent something good, but because they represent a greater evil. This is a carving of Pazuzu, king of the Lilu wind demons of Mesopotamian myth. It is he who speaks out from within Reagan, claiming her as his own. Like Bess, Pazuzu was a protector of women, children, and childbirth. However, he did not do this out of kindness. Pazuzu's rival, Lamashtu, was said to take children from their mothers while they breastfed to devour the infants whole. The demon protected them as a way to slight his rival not out of kindness or concern. What little is left to us paints Pazuzu as a dark being associated with agony, suffering, and disease. Superstition led Mesopotamians to wear charms of Pazuzu as trinkets to ward off lesser evil spirits and keep them away from their homes. But this did not mean that Pazuzu was welcome in these homes, far from it. After all, it is not hard to imagine that Pazuzu's interest in women and children was far from innocent. 
True to his form as a demon, Pazuzu first appears to Reagan under the guise of Captain Howdy, an imaginary friend, before he slowly reveals his true colors and begins his grinding assault on her mind, fully intent on gaining control over her. Which begs the question, why did Pazuzu possess Reagan? There are two in-depth analyses by film critic Rob Ager which respectively cover a theory regarding Reagan and the opening sequence of The Exorcist, both of which we need to briefly address as they offer some interesting interpretations we cannot ignore. In the first video, Ager discusses a theory according to which Burke Dennings, a friend of Chris and the director of the movie that she stars in, was secretly inappropriate with Reagan. While there is no explicit mention of this, and the book outright debunks this idea, the more obscene moments in the movie seem to work with this theory, and some believe that as the director, Friedkin wanted to imply this. It gives a clear source of trauma to Reagan which the demon can exploit, and it is also consistent with the idea of evil against evil. Pazuzu would at first be subconsciously welcomed by Reagan as a way to defend herself against Dennings. And while the man is indeed killed after being left alone with Reagan, Pazuzu is not simply going to leave afterwards. He has motivations of his own. In his second video, Eger argues that there are many ways in which Pazuzu's symbolism bleeds into other parts of the movie. One of these, for instance, is his aggressively sexual nature, as expected of a demon whose genitalia are living snakes. Which could be another explanation for why Reagan behaves in the way that she does after the possession. But there are two central aspects of Pazuzu that are indisputably put on display by the movie. First is his nature as a demon of the wind. Aside from the obvious moments when the wind blows to remind us of Pazuzu's malign presence, the more subtle implication is that, like the wind, Pazuzu is invisible. What made mental afflictions and possession indistinguishable in the past was the fact that there is no visible sign of the demon besides the changed behavior of the victim. Victims of conditions like epilepsy were often thought to be possessed, and acute mental conditions that caused hysteria and agitation were most likely perceived in the same way. Ironically, Pazuzu's influence over Reagan is at first mistaken to be a disorder of the nerves because the outward symptoms are similar to those of the condition. This leads us to the second central aspect of Pazuzu, his nature as a demon of sickness and disease. Reagan being evaluated by the best doctors that money can afford, using the most advanced technology of the time, leads to nothing. Because Pazuzu is not a mere disease. On the contrary, he has mastery over diseases, and the way in which Reagan's body deteriorates and becomes infected as the movie progresses is a clear indication of this. He is showing the human doctors what disease looks like, and making it clear that he is far more than a mere illness. In essence, as a demon, Pazuzu is undetected and unexplainable until he willingly decides to show himself. In showing that modern science and medicine are powerless before him, he is sending a message. If you wish to take me away from my prize, you will need to use the old ways. And there are few who still know them. As much as some of the sequels that followed would like to say otherwise, I prefer the interpretation that Reagan is not necessarily what Pazuzu is after. Regardless of why Regan was vulnerable to him, Pazuzu has found his way into her. He will gladly take her as a prize, but as a demon, he is privy to secret ways that mere mortals cannot understand. He knows that, if he takes over this child and torments her, there are those who will eventually come to try and save her. An old enemy and a new one. What does an exorcist do? The obvious answer is that they perform exorcisms, rituals meant to remove whatever dark entity is possessing a person from their unwilling host. But the goal of the exorcism is not the destruction of the demon. A firefighter does more than put down fires. In fact, one could even say that often the last thing a firefighter does is stop the flames. Before anything else, a firefighter saves lives. But some fires cannot be put out, not in time to save lives. And that is when the firefighter must enter the burning building. Earlier I spoke of charms as a way of protecting against dark entities, but sometimes more extreme measures are required. 
Across human cultures, there are plenty of rituals designed to rebuke the malice of demons. And even to destroy them. Of course, these rituals were not merely meant to be practical. There is symbolism and meaning behind every single one. Wendigo ceremonies were conducted by the Ojibwe to remind themselves of the darkness that lay just outside of the norms that they, as a people, had set for themselves since time immemorial. The mask bearing, backwards dance around a drum, served both to ward off the Wendigo and to impress upon people the dangers of unfettered greed and malicious desire. To resist a demon's corruption, one had to have a strong mind and a deep faith in the laws and customs of one's people. The spiritual leaders of the community are the ones expected to convey this message and to protect their people from these unseen threats. Christian faith places a great burden upon priests. They are expected to be like the churches where they preach, inviolable bastions of faith, where no dark entity can triumph. Few are those who live up to this expectation. The priest Lancaster Marin is an interesting character. Despite having very little screen time, he still serves a fundamental role to the story. He is the titular exorcist, and he earned his title by performing an exorcism and removing a demon from a child in his youth. While this is only explicitly revealed to us later in the movie, the opening sequence makes it clear to us who that demon is. Pazuzu is vengeful, and he is crafty. He knows that throughout all of these years, Marin has not forgotten their encounter. And he knows that back then, Marin had the physical and mental fortitude to endure the exorcism ritual. But Marin has gotten old, and his heart is starting to fail him. The possession of Reagan is an obvious trap set by Pazuzu to lure in Marin and have his revenge on the man who humiliated him. The trap is perfect because Pazuzu knows no other priest will be able to perform the exorcism, and that Marin will recognize the return of his old foe. However, there is another man who has incurred Pazuzu's wrath, and for entirely different reasons, he too will be pulled into the exorcism. Daniel Karras is a peculiar man in that he is both a Catholic priest and a psychiatrist. At the start of the movie, we find him living a difficult life. His work requires him to help other priests deal with their own mental health, and this in turn is making Karas lose his faith. To make matters worse, Karas' mother, whom he left behind in New York City as he moved to Washington for work, becomes sick and ultimately passes away after being wrongly placed in a mental institution instead of a hospital. As a psychiatrist, Daniel understands the power that a bad environment can have on a fragile mental state, and how a person's mental state can have an effect on their health. Deep down, he feels that he is responsible for his mother's death, and that he has failed not only as a priest and a psychiatrist, but as a son. It would not be an exaggeration to say that Daniel is at the lowest point of his life when Chris McNeil contacts him, and that by then, his faith is all but gone. How do you go about getting an exorcism? I beg your pardon? If, um, if a person... You know, possessed by a demon or something. How do they how do they get an exorcism? Well, the first thing I'd have to get him into a time machine and get him back to the sixteenth century. I didn't get you. Well, it just doesn't happen anymore, Miss McNeil. Oh, um, yes, since when? Well, since we learned about mental illness, paranoia, schizophrenia. All those things they taught me at Harvard. Miss McNeil, since the day I joined the Jesuits. I've never met one priest who has performed an exorcism, not one. In a way, as he says this to Chris, Karis is also trying to convince himself. In losing his faith, Daniel has stopped believing in many things, not only concerning demons and their powers of possession, but concerning the afterlife. This has allowed him to purposefully deny a possibility that gnaws at the back of his mind. That the mother he left alone to die is now in hell. Karis's fear is shown to us through a nightmare. It is in this haunting sequence that the priest and the demon first come into contact with one another. When Daniel meets with Reagan, his psychiatric logic is slowly supplanted by a growing unease at the understanding that he is indeed witnessing a real possession, and that he has already met the demon in question. As he confronts Pazuzu, the demon taunts him with his mother's voice and with the fact that he abandoned her. 
Dime, why you do this to me? This showcases the greatest advantage that demons have over humans. Nothing can be hidden from them. We are not merely familiar to them. Demons know us far more intimately than our friends, family and partners ever could. When demons gaze into our minds, they see it all. All the insecurities, all the fear, all the anxieties and obsessions. They know what feeds our guilt. They know us better than we know ourselves. Pazuzu cannot corrupt Marin because the priest knows the demon in his ways. That is why Pazuzu wants him to try and fail in saving this child. To show him that even if his will is still strong, his mortal body can no longer keep up. But Karis is different. The psychiatrist priest is chosen by Pazuzu because his mind is fraught with guilt and doubt. But also because the very existence of Karis is an insult to the king of the Lilu. Through cruelty, ignorance and fear, mankind has tormented itself for time immemorial, and been the cause for each other's mental anguish. But in equating the demons of the past with mental illness, Daniel robs them of their legacy. It is as if to say that all behavior that has ever strayed from normality is due to the human mind, and to the human mind alone. That all of the dissonant music that was ever played was merely produced by the instruments themselves. Demons know of the human mind. For each of us, they know exactly what kind of trauma it would take to change us forever. And they know that because, deep inside, we all hide things that we could never share with others. Because none but ourselves would ever truly understand. Only demons do understand. Daniel Karras does manage what is seemingly one last heroic act before dying, by allowing Pazuzu into his body and jumping out of the window before he can take over, a selfless sacrifice that saves Reagan from the demon. But this act is tainted by the fact that Pazuzu knows Daniel's greatest fear, as well as his greatest guilt, and pitches them against each other, giving him an impossible choice. After all, Christian scripture is very clear as to what happens to those who take their own lives. Alas, this is the only way that Daniel can save Reagan and Pazuzu knows that he will make that choice. He knew from the moment he first entered his nightmares. There lies the true cruelty of Pazuzu and of all demons like him. They can possess our bodies and make us do horrible things, but they don't need to. With the strum of their fingers and the thrum of their voice, they can change the sound of our song. And we will play it. What choice would we ever truly have when they know exactly how we are tuned.